So there I was, minding my own business, sitting in an ambulance with my feet out the window when I was assigned to a call for a 35-year-old male with abdominal pain. I was driving, but I had a strong partner attending. It was about 7 a.m., but we found the patient to be pretty heavily intoxicated. Blitzed, as a matter of fact. Hammered. He had upper abdominal pain that radiated to his back, consistent with his previous experience with pancreatitis. I'm Angry Bill, and this is Pre-Hospital Wisdom. We understand that medicine is medicine, but pre-hospital providers have special skills, knowledge, and culture that other providers don't have. Let's raise the bar here a little. We found out that he signed out AMA from a nearby hospital last night during treatment for pancreatitis. He wanted to leave, get himself all liquored up, and then take care of his belly pain. Nice. Anyway, we took him back to the hospital. My partner blew my mind, though. You see, normally I hate to be the driver when running a pancreatitis call. There are a lot of paramedics who don't actually treat an intoxicated pancreatitis patient. Sure, they'll give him a ride to the hospital, sometimes sitting on the bench seat rather than the bed, with a nice rant about how drinking caused their problems so they should quit drinking, thrown in at no extra cost. I think care like that is shameful. My partner on this call, however, started an IV and gave the patient plenty of fentanyl along with some fluids. It bothers me that it seems as though many paramedics don't adequately treat pancreatitis patients. I don't know what causes that. They either don't know what it is, how serious it can be, how painful it is, or don't want to treat a condition caused by alcohol. Let me try to fix that. What is pancreatitis? In the simplest way of thinking, pancreatitis is the inflammation, the itis, of the pancreas. The pancreas secretes hormones like insulin, glucagon, and so on in pancreatic juice. Pancreatic juice is comprised of digestive enzymes that aid digestion and absorption of nutrients in the small intestine. Pancreatic juice can be activated in the pancreas rather than in the small intestine. Digestion outside of where it is supposed to be hurts. It affects between 5 and 35 people per 100,000 depending on which study you look at. Mortality is pretty consistently reported to be about 5%. 1.5% in mild and 17% in severe pancreatitis. Necrotizing pancreatitis results in even higher mortality. What causes pancreatitis? The most common causes are gallstones and alcoholism. Those two causes result in about 75% of cases. Other causes include trauma, steroid use, mumps, autoimmune disease, hyperlipidemia, some medical procedures, genetic disorders, and I'm sure others. But those are the main ones. The ideology of pancreatitis is not well understood but this is one of the easiest ways to think of what's going on. A gallstone can travel down the common bile duct and block the outflow of the pancreatic duct. So pancreatic juice can't flow into the duodenum. A fatty alcoholic liver can screw up the outflow as well by pinching off the smaller pancreatic ductules. Thus, the juice, especially the trypsin, starts to do the work in the pancreas itself. What we're talking about is autodigestion. That's as horrible and painful as it sounds. Now, I understand that this is overly simplified and there are other causes of pancreatitis, but this is a quick YouTube video, not a GI textbook entry, and it's a decent model to understand what's going on. Are there different kinds? Besides acute and chronic, pancreatitis is also divided into mild and severe. Essentially, acute pancreatitis is hurting now and chronic pancreatitis isn't hurting at the moment. The difference between mild and severe is that severe acute pancreatitis results in shock, abscess formation, necrosis, and or organ failure. So the guy at the beginning of the post most likely was suffering from mild acute pancreatitis. How does pancreatitis present? The most common presentation is upper abdominal pain or left upper quadrant pain. It can radiate to the back and interestingly, the amount of pain is worse than the amount of tenderness. Nausea and vomiting associated with eating is common. Blood pressure, heart rates, and respiratory rates can all be elevated due to pain, but blood pressure can also be decreased if bleeding or dehydration is occurring. In about 3% of pancreatitis patients, Cullen sign, periumbilical ecchymosis, or Gray-Turner sign, flank ecchymosis, are visible. These are signs of hemorrhage, so lift a shirt and look at the belly. Diagnosis results from characteristic abdominal pain with elevated blood amylase and lipase. The blood amylase and lipase can be three to six times as high as the normal reference value. Ultrasound can illuminate the cause of pancreatitis, such as alcoholic fatty liver or gallstones, plus an inflamed pancreas can be visible. CT scans can also be helpful. What else should be on the differential diagnosis list? Consider other causes of epigastric abdominal pain, peptic ulcer disease, gallstones, acute 
cholecystitis, perforated viscous, occult trauma, always, uh, intestinal obstruction, mesenteric ischemia, hepatitis. What's the treatment for pancreatitis? Hospital protocols begin with fluid replacement of 5 to 10 milliliters per kilogram per hour of isotonic crystalloid with reassessment based on lab values and patient fluid status. Opioid analgesia is administered. Plenty of fentanyl or dilaudid are commonly used. Morphine has fallen out of favor for pancreatitis patients. Pancreats are held NPO, nothing per oral, until the pain decreases and inflammatory markers improve. While this occurs usually after 24 to 48 hours, the NPO duration can easily last three to five days. Severe pancreatitis can result in longer periods without oral food, so enteral or parenteral nutrition would be required. Antibiotics are used for extra pancreatic infections. The symptoms of alcohol withdrawal are treated for admitted alcoholics. So what should we be doing in the field for these patients? It's fluids and analgesia. Don't go nuts on the fluids, though. We can get a liter of crystalloid into a patient in like 10 or 15 minutes if we try hard enough. That would probably be excessive, except in cases of severe shock. I just run the IV a little faster than the normal TKO drip rate to end up delivering a few hundred milliliters during transport. As for analgesia, fentanyl is a good choice with a good safety profile. Pancreatitis is a weird pathology to me. I don't understand how paramedics can commonly minimize or ignore the problem. I've seen medics lecture patients about how drinking with pancreatitis is dumb, rather than treat the problem. That doesn't occur for many other issues, even those that are patient-caused. We treat suicide attempts, right? We treat people after they say, hey, y'all, hold my beer and watch this, don't we? We treat cardiac arrest from alcoholism. Do you think a lecture to a drunk changes his or her future behavior? Do you think non-treatment will teach them a lesson? Knock it off. Please start treating your pancreatitis patients appropriately if you aren't already, even when they are self-intentionally drunk. Let me know what you think. One of the most helpful things you can do is to share this content with someone you know. Click here for another video or click over here uh, for the channel page in all videos. Subscribe to another button around here. I think it's down below. I'm Angry Bill, and until next time, stay safe.